the Cowboys season could be continuing in here this weekend. Instead, it's in here. For the sixth time in their last eight playoff appearances, Dallas went one and done in the playoffs, and their drought of not making it past the divisional round is now 21 years. To create more opportunities to play, Gallo is working out at multiple positions. First base, third base, and left field. But as long as he produces at the plate, the Rangers will find a place for him. As with any extreme sport, going down ramps is not enough. There are also tricks involved, and they are a treat. Being a prominent college mascot doesn't just come with the perk of getting into games like football or basketball or baseball. It also comes with perks outside of sports, like performing at the Country Music Awards. The third round of the AT&T Byron Nelson was Jordan Spieth bobblehead day, and like a lot of bobbleheads, it only kind of sort of resembles him. That's actually fitting, as he had only kind of sort of resembled himself here with one top 25 finish in five tries. UT fans here may have wanted to bury their heads in the sand after losing to longtime rival A&M on Wednesday, but at least on Thanksgiving, they could be thankful for a rebound win over Washington. I asked Ladisseur how he's able to bond with players who are as many as 14 years younger than he is. He said it's definitely not the music that plays during practices, but all that matters is they all love football, because unlike some of the guys here, that never gets old. TCU hosting Baylor on social media night, so to put that in emoji form, we've got Horned Frogs versus Bears in baseball. Frogs up 3-0 in the fourth. Baylor had second and third with one out, but Nick Lodolo back-to-back -back strikeouts to escape. Crowd giving that two thumbs up. Lodolo only one run over six innings. Bottom four, TCU with second and third now. Elliott Barzilli flies to right. Tough win bringing it back in, and it's going to fall for an RBI single. Baylor fans cannot believe that. Still in the fourth, they're loaded now for Luke and Baker with two outs. Rips a single, which will get by the left fielder. All three runners come in to score. That'll earn some praise from the Frog faithful. TCU with a big smiley face in this one. They take it 9 to 4. How about Mansfield and Cedar Hill? Cedar Hill playing without quarterback Avery Davis. Ankle injury sat as a precaution. Kennedy Brooks from Mansfield lit it up. Fifth touchdown of the game here. He had 272 yards. Tigers lead by 20 points in the fourth, but it ain't over. Cedar Hill responding as they turn the horns loose. Marquise Foreman, 55-yard touchdown run, his second of the game, and the horns are within six. Now, final seconds of the game. They got fourth and goal from the two. Foreman gets the call, dives for the end zone. The refs say he's in, which is, of course, all that matters, but replay shows, uh, not so much. Mansfield might be talking about this one for a long time, but for now, that stands in the extra point was the difference. 42-41, the final there. And we could even throw in Euless Trinity down 20-0 to yeah. Spring Westfield after one quarter, came back to win 28-27, also with a final minute touchdown. So my first question for our DFW, Annis Neil Beasley, <laughs> is have you caught your breath yet? Yeah, does it get any crazier than that? Of all the games we were watching last <laughs> week, I don't think anybody was really watching Trinity and Byron Nelson. Trinity 5-1, and one, Byron Nelson 0-5. Oh it goes to overtime. <laughs> Trinity scored but missed its extra point. Byron Nelson makes its extra point, wins 21-20. A slight correction, if you saw the 6A and 5A polls earlier, I said there were no changes in the top 10. That's because I was looking at the wrong numbers column, so flag on me. It just comes down to confidence and the motivation that you have. At 27 years old, Jason Rico Reyes was an active member of the Navy and a married father of two. Then one day, his life changed forever, a day he does not remember and never will. I was in a motorcycle accident, from my understanding, and then I was in a coma, and I just woke up and I was paralyzed. At first, it's a big shock, because you're trying to figure it out, and then it just takes adapting. I spoke to other veterans, and they explained, look, you just have to try to figure it out. Do not dwell on it, because it, it'll eat at you. In search of an activity to help his transition, Reyes befriended a fellow veteran who was involved in WCMX, or wheelchair motocross, essentially skateboarding with wheelchairs. I tried it, I liked it, and then I started meeting with friends at the skate park to start learning stuff. And you know, you go down your first drop in, and you go down your first ramp, and you go up. And after that, I just kept progressing. At first, it was me trying to prove it to myself, to build that confidence. And then now it's showing everybody else everything they said I couldn't do, I'm doing. 
and now they're freaking out about it because they have to bite their tongue. Having found something of a salvation in the sport, Reyes is now working to help others find it, both old and especially young, at clinics like the ones hosted by Rise Adaptive Sports in Grand Prairie. <laughs> Eight-year-old Kumaka Jensen, born with spina bifida, which left him paralyzed below his waist, has already been WCMXing for a couple years, and it's been a similar saving grace. It's just been amazing, the change in his attitude. He doesn't want help with anything. He always tells me, I got it, I got it. So it's just uh, it's a, it's a great thing. It kind of feels like I'm going to, into an airplane. I'm going down, crashing into an airplane. What about sometimes you fall over? Does it hurt? Nope, I get back up. If I fall again, I get back up again. It's amazing. It's gratifying. It's, it's, it's something when you see them and they're they're doing it and their eyes open up and they're like, and they're like, and right when they when they come all the way to the flat ground, they're like, and they start, you know, you clap for them and you, you let them understand you did it. Do it again. As with any extreme sport, going down ramps is not enough. There are also tricks involved, and they are a treat. The backflip's definitely a little bit more gnarly, but um, you know you got to stick with it, and it's it's a lot of fun. You heard that right, the backflip. Aaron Wheels Fotheringham, another spina bifida survivor, pioneered the move, which is fitting as he pioneered the whole sport. Not surprisingly, it took a lot of practice and pain to perfect it. Kept over rotating and just smacking my head on the concrete. Ugh, and that's, you know, that's scary. And if you're ever gonna stop, that's almost the stopping point, you know, like, and I was like, man, you know, should I keep doing this? Like, I, you know, cause naturally you're kind of like, maybe I should stop doing this, but if you really want it, you gotta keep going. And um, once you land it and you roll away, it's the best feeling ever, you know? Like 50 crashes and then one land, completely worth it. The backflip is not just a trick, it's a testament to overcoming their adversity. For the small group that has landed it, it marks a breakthrough moment in their lives. It was emotional. There was a woman at the skate park. When I landed it, she was like, she was All right, here we go. so surprised. Like, oh my God, he did it. And when I see that, it's, I feel good about myself. But if you think the backflip is the biggest trick out there, think again. Extreme sports are all about going bigger, and Fotheringham has already landed a double backflip as well as a front flip, and he's not stopping there. I've been working on a double front flip. Um, that's one of my next goals, which is terrifying, you know, but uh, I feel like it's really possible. Bigger than the big tricks, though, is the opportunity for the wheelchair bound to bond, regardless of age, race, and gender. Here, they're not different from everyone else. They're the same and having each other to lean on makes it easier to roll with life's punches for everyone involved. It's a great support group and everybody helps, you know, every, each person helps, uh, you know, the kids help each other, the parents, you know, give their advice here and there and it's, it's just great to get together and meet new people. The wheelchair community is, is not very big, it, it's, it's small, but now with the WCMX and the sport progressing, more people are becoming educated as to people being in a wheelchair. They just kind of see their chair in a new light. Um, I think that's the most important because for me, I've never seen my wheelchair as, you know, a medical instrument. It's always been, you know, like a bike or a skateboard. We're trying uh, to motivate the younger generation to fully understand that, enjoy life, enjoy it how it is. You can't walk like everybody else, but hey, you can roll. NASCAR has always had colorful characters, and since 1984, it's had colorful infields with intricate artwork promoting the sponsors. As you'd expect, it takes a lot of work to go from this to this. Alan Jones was part of the first painting at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Now his Jones Sign Company does most of the NASCAR tracks along the East Coast and Texas Motor Speedway. When we first started, we uh, did a more uh, rudimentary uh, type of layout where we just uh, used measuring tools only, like 100-foot tape measure and string. While the process has become much more sophisticated, it amazingly does not involve any stencils. Instead, a GPS program turns the designs into coordinates, and a tracking monitor shows the painters where to paint, which they do freehand. 
whole field is on the one uh, handheld computer. And so you can zoom in to each point that you want to uh, identify and uh, then you just uh, uh, paint it with the uh, spray cans and uh, that's, that's it. Sounds difficult, but Jones says it's actually not. It is that simple. It is really that simple? Yeah, I could, a monkey could do it. <laughs> no, Don't tell my uh, guys that I said that. Jones says the infield at Texas Motor Speedway typically requires about 1,500 gallons of paint and 400 hours of work split between four painters. And their job on the ground depends largely on the sky. Once it's dry, it's waterproof. So if you can get the paint down and you can have sunlight to dry it, then you've accomplished something. But, you know, a whole week of rain uh, that, you know, we wouldn't get anything done. So what's the closest call Jones has had? A mere two days to get everything finished. How do you squeeze 400 hours of work into two days? Oh, magic. <laughs> <laughs> Even worse than wet weather is when drivers wipe out his work. Oh, I hate that. I really do, yeah. When you see the guy heading for it, you know it's coming. Do you kind of look away? Do you cringe? Uh, yeah, and I cuss. Yeah. Of course, the paintings are all temporary anyway, and the pride Jones gets from having millions of people see them lasts far longer. It is reaching all over the world. It's reaching my friends in London. They call up and uh, talk about it. So, so, yeah, it's worldwide. So the next time you watch a race, pay some extra attention to the infield because now you know it's a lot more interesting than just watching paint dry. As you heard there, the homestay program is a huge part of the volunteer effort and it's a huge commitment. Each local host family takes two foreign participants and they have to house them, drive them to practices, games, events, which can be a challenge in Metroplex traffic, plus provide meals and entertainment. While that sounds like a bit of a burden, those who have done it say it's an honor to provide world-class hospitality for a world-class event. Once someone hosts and they talk about the experience and word gets out, everybody wants to do it. I mean, we had families we had to say no to this year um, because we had so many. We've hosted a team from India, uh, Denmark, and two from England, so we definitely get a, a diversified culture experience. We hosted Costa Ricans the first time, uh, some Swedes the second time, and now we got some Germans. They teach us about their lifestyle, um, their professionalism, everything that goes in the ins and outs and the, their uh, way of life. Um, so it, it's really neat how we can just uh, feed off of each other. It's a symbiotic relationship. It's just a marvelous enrichment opportunity. We, we've got kids from inner London that you know don't get the chance to see and travel and see new places and they've never been out of England, a lot of them, um, let alone America. So the whole experience is it's just fantastic. They're a long way from home. So we, we, as a family, we try and learn some of the phrases just to kind of make them feel comfortable. Um, but you quickly get past that. Regardless of what religion, um, geography, diversity, they, they bond and it's incredible. In Germany, we are always in hotels and it's also good to have other experiences and to learn more about the culture in America. I thought it was going to be just like in the films, where you see a lot of cowboys and things like that, but it's nowhere near. The biggest thing across, across the board for the last four years, the shopping, the, the malls. They all want to shop and they're all amazed. They think the prices here are really cheap, actually. And the, um, the fast food, a lot of them don't have fast food. It's, I mean, they're amazed at all the fast food chains, all, every, almost every corner. The houses, the cars, the roads, everything. Everything's just bigger, it seems bigger. Like, look at the house that. You know, the families take care of you so well, you know, you, you experience different things. And by the end of the week, you, you really feel like you're part of the family, you know, you've made friends for life, hopefully. I still talk to all three pairs of kids that I've hosted, Myron and Sajid from, from India, and then the, the kids from England from Towers that we hosted, uh, the kids last year from Denmark that we hosted. We still, we still keep up with them on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I mean, it's really easy now with social media. Every year, I'm shocked at how close we become to them. There's tears when we drop them off at the airport. You know, you think there's no way that's going to happen. You think, oh, well, this was just the exception. And then it happens again and again and again. An average of 30 teams and 30 referees take advantage of the homestay program each year.